Today we're, we're launching a brand new series called David, Confessions of a King. And I have been uh, just so ready to get to this uh, series because the life and the message of David that we see in First and Second Samuel speaks so much to my life. To First Samuel chapter number 16. First Samuel chapter number 16. As we look at David, the confessions of a king, today I want to talk to you about power for your purpose. Power for your purpose. If God has a divine purpose for your life, do not attempt to try to do a divine purpose through a, 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 just a single-handed man ability. Don't try to accomplish a, a God-sized vision, dream, passion, purpose uh, in, in, in your own strength and in your own abilities. You, it's destructive. It, 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 will, it will fall and fail. You have to have God's power in order to accomplish God's purpose for your life. So here um, we see in, in this story of First Samuel chapter number 16, I want you to, if you've already turned there or if you're looking at your notes, we see David who um, is about to be anointed. And this is the moment when the power of God comes upon David. And I want you to see this because if you're here today and, and you're just not so sure, I'm just telling you, you need the power of God on your life. In order to fulfill the, the purpose that God has for you, you need the power of God to accomplish that purpose. So in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, I want you to see when God's power comes on David. Um, right here in verse number 11, look at that with me. Chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. Verse number 11, the Bible says, Then Samuel said to Jesse, I told first service, it's hard for me to think of Jesse without thinking about the Dukes of Hazzard. I just, when I read Jesse, I think of overalls and a white beard. It's just, so Jesse was in his overalls and white beard, and he had a son named David. But he, he says, Samuel said to Jesse, all, Are all your sons here? Because here's what happened up to this point. Uh, Samuel is, is told to go and anoint a new king. He says, God, are you sure? Don't you know Saul's going to kill me? Because Saul was the reigning king. And the Lord said, that's okay, I want you to go anoint a new king because I have rejected Saul as king because Saul's life was veering away from God. He had walked in blatant sin before the Lord and he, had, he, he began to take a, a path that was away from God. So the Lord said, I'm not going to allow him to reign any longer and I want a man that will be after me. So he told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and anoint, the, anoint one of the sons. So all of the sons passed before um, Samuel the prophet and immediately Eliab, the first one, comes. And, he, and Samuel says, you know what? He, he's got to be the one. Look at his stature. I mean, he looks like a king. And the Lord spoke to his heart, and he said, I don't want you to look at the outward appearance. I want you to, because I don't look on the outward appearance, but I look upon the heart. So that's not the one. And he goes through all seven. And that's all of them that are there. And this is where we pick up. And he says, is this all of them? Jesse says, there remains yet the youngest. They didn't even think to call him, right? I mean, he's He's such an underdog, such an unlikely, that they didn't even call him up to the house when they said, gather all your sons. Like he was from a, um, like a whole other race or something. He's just out there doing his own thing. And, and Samuel said to Jesse, send for him and get him, for we won't sit down until he comes. And I, I preached this, this part of it not too long ago, but I, I want to move past this. And he sent him and he brought him in, and, and he was ruddy, and he had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took a horn of oil. That'll wreck your day. You're out tending sheep. They call you in and he says, hey, I'm going to pour this bucket of oil over your head, okay? I mean, you know, that, I mean, you take a shower in oil, that'll mess stuff up. Like, then dust sticks to you, you know, it's all crazy. So that, that's kind of where they're at. But this pouring on of oil was, was symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. It, it, the Bible speaks of the, the oil, of Aaron, uh, the oil uh, that ran down Aaron's beard. In other words, it's not just a little bit of oil. It is an, an encompassing of the oil all over you as it runs down your body. And it speaks of the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit that comes upon someone. So here's David. The prophet comes to anoint him. Why did he anoint him? He's anointing him for a purpose that is to lie before him. He's saying, you're going to be king. I'm anointing you for the purpose of kingship. It's what happened in, in their day. But this is what I want you to see. David had purpose, so he was anointed. You have purpose, so you need to be anointed. You say, well, I didn't come prepared. I don't have a change of clothes. I'm not talking about that kind of anointing. I'm talking about the, 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 the coming on of the Holy Spirit, and we see that right here. And the Spirit of the Lord, look, this is what happened when, when the oil flowed down his body. The Bible says this, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed on David. 
I've been reading the NLT to you, but I, I like the ESV. I love the way it says that not just the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, but the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And look what's happening at the same time in verse number 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit. From the Lord tormented him. In other words, when, da when David received this fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit for the purpose that God was calling him to, the, the pulling away of God's Spirit happened for, uh, in Saul's life because he had veered away and departed from the things of God. Can I just say today that if you expect to walk in the power of God and live life your way, you can forget it. Listen, purity always precedes power. Purity always comes before power. So we want to live lives that are pure so that we can experience the power of God. And this is what we see here. So the, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The Lord has rejected him as king even though he stays on the throne for a while. The Spirit of the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Um, let our Lord command your servants um, who are before you. To, to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the liar. And when, harmful spirit, when the harmful spirit of God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. And then look at verse number 17. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. Now, David has already been anointed king. This is powerful. David has been anointed king. He has this private ceremony where the Lord speaks to him, anoints him, the spirit of God comes upon him. And now he's about to, Submit himself to the authority that's in place. He doesn't become high and mighty and puffed up and arrogant. He remains tempered before the Lord. And he says, Lord, if, even though you've anointed me king and I don't have a throne yet, I'll, I'll still serve if you call me to serve. That's good. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, behold, I've seen this one. I, I've seen the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. So he's a, he's a great musician, he says. He just begins to list off the attributes. I like this about David. If I could have any of these, this is one I want. And this guy recognizes David, and he said, and the Lord is with him. And the Lord is with him. Come on, church, could, could we have a heart to say, you know what, you, could, you can keep the eloquence. I don't care if I babble and ramble. I don't care if I sound stupid, open my mouth, stupid rolls out. If the, if the Lord will just be with me, everything else will be okay. I'll, I'll, I, you can have all of the rest of them, but let the Lord be with me. And the fact that everybody else noticed that. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse. He said, send me David, your son, who's with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat, and he sent him by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. In other words, David submitted himself, and he goes to serve Saul, and he's playing for him and helping him. And the Bible says Saul loved him greatly for a season. So he got mad at him and he wanted to kill him. And Saul loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. So here's the anointed king. And now he's saying, I, I'll pick up your armor. I'll serve you. What a powerful picture of the heart of a man who's been entrusted with great power. Who's been poured on with great anointing. Yet he still finds himself submitting, surrendering, and keeping his heart pure before the Lord. And we can learn from this today. If, if I can, I, I want to share with you three observations concerning your purpose and God's power. Your purpose and God's power. We see in this passage of scripture. The first thing I want you to see today is it's the purpose of God in your life that merits the power of God in your life. I'll say it again. It is the purpose of God for your life, on your life, God has a purpose for your life. It's the purpose of God in your life that merits the power of God in your life. In other words, God has purpose for you, and to accomplish that purpose, you need his power to get there. Every person under the sound of my voice has a divine purpose, a divine calling, a divine ministry, a reason for which you exist outside of yourself. We live in such a culture that is self-absorbed and self-consumed. We take 47,000 selfies uh, all the time because we want everybody to see me and us. And there's nothing wrong with selfies, so don't let anybody get your feathers ruffled and get offended. Teenage girls. Just, so, it's a, just kidding. Uh, 
But the deal is, when we become so self-absorbed, again, there's nothing wrong with selfies, but when we become so self-absorbed that we can't realize that we live for a greater purpose than self, then something is wrong. Every one of us have a divine purpose, a God-ordained purpose. David's divine purpose I need you to see this. Before we can get to the power, you got to see your purpose because the two are, are interlinked. you got to see that David's purpose was prepared and planned even before the foundations of the earth. Do you believe that? Before the world were created, God had a plan for a man named David. And if God had a plan for a man named David before the foundations of the world, God had a plan for, for Jack and for Jan and, and, and for Andy and for Tom and for Susie and whatever your name is, put yourself in there. God had a plan for you before you were ever even an idea in anyone's mind. God had this divine plan and purpose. He had a course set for you, and that course involved uh, accepting and, and, and allowing the, 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 the God of the universe to change your life and to set you free from the sin and the sickness and the disease and all the stuff that you had allowed to happen in your life and had been a part of and allowed that God to set you free. And then after enjoying and being a part of his uh, in a relationship with him, then walking in that freedom and sharing it with other people. Look with me in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible speaks of the genealogy of Jesus. The Bible says this, Matthew 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This is the part where you check out when you're reading, right? You're like, beget so-and-so and beget, and beget so-and-so, and they beget so-and-so, and they, uh, like you go to sleep. There really is a lot of meaning there. The book of, look at what it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, so David, a part of the genealogy of Jesus, the plan that God had to bring Jesus as the Messiah, the anointed one, into the world to save us from our sin, the message of the gospel. Don't you think that that message was prepared before the foundations of the world? That's what Ephesians 1.4 says. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.4, even as he chose us in him, in who? In Christ, because of what Christ did for us, God chose us in him before the foundations of the world, before anything was created. God chose us in Christ. Therefore, the Lord knew that Jesus Jesus would, would come. He had a plan to redeem mankind even before men had sinned. So the Lord chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. God had this plan. It, it, the plan had th this, this lineage and the lineage of Jesus had David in it. As a matter of fact, when you look at the life of David, there's so many types and shadows that, that are a foretelling of Jesus. It's remarkable. So what I'm telling you today is that David's divine purpose was planned just like your divine purpose was planned. I'm here to, to, before we even talk about power, to challenge you and help you understand today that we don't live life aimlessly drifting through as believers. Oh, we can. We can live mediocre and, and, and short of what God wants for us and would have for us, but the question that bears us all asking today is, am I living the purpose that God has destined for me to live? Am I living the purpose that I'm created for? Am I accomplishing the task that God has for me? Your divine pur purpose is before you and was created before the foundation of the world. The Lord said, I have a plan for you. Second Timothy 1 verse 9 says this, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. Because of God's purpose and grace, he called us to this holy calling, not because of anything we've done, but because he desired to use us for his purpose. He had this purpose and he uses us by his grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began or before the creation of the world. That's a good word for somebody. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. The Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing. It is the free gift of God. Aren't you thankful for that? Not a result of our own work so that anyone can boast, for we are his workmanship. Another version says, we are his masterpiece. The Lord has put us together, and he's made us his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for, for what? For good works. We're created in Christ for good works. We're created with a purpose for good works. And then he goes on and he says, 
which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. What does he mean, walk in them? The the NRSV says that they should be our way of life. These good works that God has prepared before the foundation of the world should be our way of life. We're not just drifting along. Whatever happens, it's all about me. Let me see what's in it for me today. No, we live with purpose. God has a, a purpose for our lives. And it's more than living 60 or 70 years for ourselves and dying. Because when we die, we will stand before a holy God. And we will account for every word and every deed that we lived. So we live these good works as a way of life. Not trying to earn salvation. You can't earn salvation. It's a free gift. But because of the free gift, now we live with purpose. So that other people can experience the free gift. And the question that bears us asking today is, where is someone else affected by the purpose of God for my life? Because God has called us to affect other people. It, it, it's, it's so much more than, than just us, and it's so much more than just our life. So, can I just let the rubber meet the road really quickly and, and talk about that purpose. For some of you, your purpose is in your home, and there's nothing short about that because your purpose all of our primary calling before I ever stand behind a pulpit, I stand before my son and my wife as the the priest of my home. And our home should be our very first and foremost ministry. Don't ever be ashamed to say, my home is my ministry. If you're a stay-at-home mom, that's not a, 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 like a, a slap in the face and, and you're less than because you do that. That might be the, the, the purpose that God has created for you for this moment. Created you for, for this moment. For some of you, I was just thinking about this. I'm, my eyes are so open recently to the, the idea of, of foster care and adoption being such a, a powerful and relevant ministry in people's, in kids' lives. Man, there are, there are kids that are going through the system uh, in, in our culture that, that don't have anybody that cares about them. They're passed from one person to the other. And I'm watching families in our church that are taking them in and they're affecting them forever by the power of Jesus. You talk about practical, lived out, everyday Jesus with skin on. When you take a child on and raise them and say, I'm going to do it and I'm going to teach them even though I don't have to. I'm going to do it because I love them and I don't want them to do without and I don't want them to not know God. Maybe it's the workplace. For some of you, your purpose right now, the season of your life, your purpose is in your workplace. That that place you mumble and grumble every time you drive up to. (laughs) Some of you are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. And the very place that you're mumbling, grumbling about the Lord is saying, I, I'm trying to teach you that right now this is your season. That person that rubs you the wrong way, th- this, is, this is the reason and the purpose for which you're here for this moment. This is your, for such a place and such a time as this. This is the place at your workplace. Some of you said, I don't even want to hear that, so I'll move on to the next one. Maybe it's, maybe it's missions. Maybe the Lord has, you know, maybe it's years ago, God birthed a, a desire in you to do something in the area of missions. Can I tell you today that God wants to put his finger on some people just like he did on David and say, I know that you may have given up on a dream because you feel like it's too far away and it costs too much and this season it just doesn't fit into your schedule. But he's putting his finger on your life and he's saying, I want to anoint you with power for the purpose that I've called you to. I want there to be an outflow of the Holy Spirit on your life to enable you to do the thing that I've purposed for you to do. He's placing his finger on some people as goers. People on the front lines of missions. we got some teams that are going on a short-term trip to Ecuador in the, the late summer. But can I tell you, I believe that Ecuador is going to be more than just a one-time short-term mission trip. But I believe that Ecuador is going to be a place that we can invest in long-term, that we can send people to long-term. I'm, I'm seeing pictures of the missionary Shannon Pruitt there as he, as he is um, building churches on the sides of, of, of uh, volcanoes. And you see these Quechua Indians in the Andes Mountains. And, and they're making a difference in these people that have never even had their own copy of the Bible. He's the first AG missionary to ever live in that area. And we get an opportunity to go and partner with him. I'm thankful for the people that are going to do that. Thankful for the goers. I'm thankful for the people like Shannon and Susan, like Mike Luton, who we went to China with a, a couple years ago. Some of, you, some of us will be senders. 
In other words, we hold the rope vicariously for other people. We send them. We, we, we make the way for them to go. Some of us will be prayers. Some of us will be mobilizers. But missions, such a powerful ministry and maybe the very purpose that God has called you in this season of life. For some people in our church, powerful ministry to those who are incarcerated around our state. It's making such a difference in the lives of men and women who maybe at one time or another felt no hope or felt like nobody cared. It's powerful to see as men's and women's lives are being transformed by people going in and sharing the message of the gospel in very practical ways and teaching. And I'm so thankful for the men and women in our church who have made that such a a priority because they believe that that is the, the purpose that God has them for in this season of life. And as they're doing that, there are times where they say, Lord, I don't have what it takes. And the Lord is saying, I'll give you the power. Just fulfill your purpose. Think about Celebrate Recovery on Friday nights, and I can't hit all of them. Listen, there's so many. I'm just throwing out some of them. Think about Celebrate Recovery. Maybe that's a a place where the Lord is using you. There are people right here in this service who God is using in a powerful, powerful way on Friday nights and on Tuesday nights, leading groups as they're they're walking with people who have come from lives and lifestyles of hurts and habits and hang-ups and and addictions and struggles and, and, and brokenness, and they're seeing God set them free from all of that as they walk together with Him. How many of you know the Lord is the one who sets us free and is pretty awesome when people come alongside and help us in that so I say all of that to say and I I wrap all of that up to to say in Hebrews chapter number 12 verse 1 and 2 the Bible says therefore since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us that race could just be the purpose that God has called you to and there's a crowd of believers that have gone before us who are watching you run the race and I'm asking you today are you running the purpose that God has placed you here for? So God has purpose for your life. And whenever God has purpose, he'll never never call you to purpose that he doesn't give you the power to accomplish the purpose. So I want you to see today that when God calls you to something, he provides the power through the enablement of his Holy Spirit to allow you to do that. It's important that we seek him for the power of his spirit. It's important that we live and walk in the power of his Holy Spirit. He wants to enable and empower us to be all that he's called us and created us to accomplish and be. The second thing I want you to see today, God's power is not distributed according to the standards of men. We come to God and we say, oh Lord, I need you. I I don't think I can do that, but I can do this. Lord, I probably can't ever accomplish that, but I, when the Lord is dealing with you about something, as hard as it is, can we just submit to him and say, God, if you call me to something and if you're stirring something in me, then I'm going to submit to that and I'm going to allow you to empower me to do it. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Bible says, the Lord told Samuel, he's looking at Eliab. He said, I know he looks like a king, but I'm, I'm not, this isn't my standard. You're not going by my standard. You're going by man's standard. He says, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not what, what a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God said, I want a man who's after me, a man that's after my own heart. And so we need to throw the spiritual resumes out the window. Well, I'm I'm not old enough. I'm too old. I I don't have enough experience. I, I really don't have enough Bible knowledge to do that. Throw the resumes out the window because for some people, you you'll be like Timothy when Paul said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But be an example for the believers. Be an example in the way you live, your lifestyle, in your speech, in your love, in the way that in your purity. Be an example for believers, even though you're young. Blow them out of the water by the way you live. For others of us, you'll be like the Caleb's who say, I know I'm 80. I know that some people might have given up by now, but I'm not sitting down. There's still a mountain to climb, and there's a mountain that God has given me, and I want my mountain. Give me my mountain. So let's throw the age thing out the window. Young or old, God still has purpose for you. No matter what your experience has been or where you've been or what you've done, how you've messed up, throw the resume out the window and realize that God wants to empower people to accomplish the purpose that he's called us to. Are you tired of me saying that yet? Chapter 16, verse 17. I love it when Samuel, or I mean Saul, is looking for somebody to play for him and this guy says, 
I've seen this boy David. He's got courage. He's a warrior. He plays skillfully. He speaks well. He looks good. And God's on his life. And I love that. I want you to hear me today in just saying this. Truly, the word of God stands, and, and you don't have to make excuses for it. If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he. These, these are just little things we learned when we were kids. This is what I teach Scout. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. We said that so many times we act like it doesn't even, doesn't even register, right? Like it's not, there's not power in it anymore, but it is the, the life-changing word of God. The last thing I want you to see today. God willingly pours power in the lives of people who passionately seek him. God willingly pours power in the lives of people who passionately seek him. One of the keys to David's great success was his passion and his heart for God. You agree with me there? David had such a a raw passion for God. God rejected one king who his heart had grown hard toward God. He began to say, I can do it my own way. I can make my own rules. I can do my own thing. But after all, I'm king. You see, the power had gotten to a place in his mind where he overrode God, the epitome of pride. David then the Bible says, I've rejected Saul as king because his pride has gotten the best. He can't handle power. power. He cannot handle power. It goes to his head. I've got a boy that doesn't think much of himself. Probably his brothers don't even acknowledge him. He's just kind of out in the sheepfold. He's in a pasture somewhere, but he's got his harp. He's writing songs. He's pouring out his heart to me. He's got a heart after me. The Bible says, In Hebrews 11, verse 6, that God rewards those who diligently seek him. As David sought after God and kept himself in the presence of God, you know what it did for him and in him? As as he passionately pursued God, it kept him in a place where the Lord could constantly temper him. He could change him and mold him. Listen, you don't spend time in the presence of God without God changing you. That's why sometimes we, we resist and we say, I, I don't know about all that emotionalism. I don't know about all them people making all that noise and crying tears. And I mean, I, I don't know about all that. You know what that is? That's fear. It's, it's fear that, that, that God's going to take more than you want to give. Submit to the Lord and allow him to do his work in you because in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. And, and there might be some emotionalism, but I'm glad that I, I don't have a, a dead dry, stone-cold religion that I can't experience the presence of the living God. 